Oh, hi, hello, you wonderful, magnificent nerds. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv. Liv, who is getting closer and closer to being able to bring you more content and better, more researched content, (sighs) the time will soon be here. And speaking of content, have you pre-ordered my goddamn book of mythology yet? Still can't believe it's real. Greek Mythology, The Gods, Goddesses, and Heroes Handbook will be available in March of next year. It's a book of Greek myths meant to give you the basics on all the important players and help you recognize where you might have heard their stories before. It's also got the most beautiful illustrations ever. Just completely, unbelievably gorgeous illustrations by Sarah Richard. They make me want to cry. You can head to my website, mythsbaby.com slash book to place a pre-order, or you can just search for places to pre-order, or you can just search for it um, to pre-order at your local bookstore, because support independent bookstores. And speaking of, Canadians, listen up. I'm going to be working with my favorite bookstore, Monroe's Books, here in Victoria, to bring you signed personalized copies of the book when you pre-order from Monroe's. I'm sorry to say this only applies to Canadians, but finally we get something special. It's about time. That's right, you get a signed book, and I get the dream come true that is wanting people to sign books. So please, if you're in Canada or specifically Victoria, consider pre-ordering from Monroe's. There's a link on the mythsbaby.com slash book website, or go to Monroe's Books. There's no E in Monroe's. And one final piece of housekeeping. You may have noticed more ads in episodes lately. This is because I switched ad companies and these this new company has ads in more markets than my previous, which was just in the States. Now I'm able to make money off of all the places where my podcast is popular. I realize it might be a little jarring though, or even a little annoying at first, but every time you find yourself a bit bummed by this change, please just remind yourself that it means that very, very soon I will be able to make a major change to how I run this podcast. It means I won't lose my mind with being tired all the time and burn out and wonder whether I can keep going, never having a moment's free time. It means more researched episodes, more Patreon episodes, more bonus content. It means Instagram lives and Q&As. It means so, so much for this, for me and this podcast, I can't even tell you. So please, what's 60 seconds of annoyance, right? Well, guess who's back? Yes, it's time, finally time, that we dive back into the story of Aeneas, the Aeneid and the propaganda-filled story of the mythical founding of Rome. Thank you for all your patience for that extended break in this story. I needed it. But it's about time we get back to Aeneas. What I'll probably do going forward is like two weeks of Aeneas episodes and then a week or two of another story before heading back to Aeneas. This story is fascinating and important, but it's no Homer. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey were epic stories about epic heroes of old, whereas the Aeneid wants to be that, but what it really is is intense pro-Rome Augustan propaganda. It's in itself interesting, but Odysseus Aeneas is not. This is episode 88, The Man, The Myth, The Legend, Aeneas. Well, we're going on six months since we last left that crazy guy where he was in Carthage, telling his tale of woe to Dido and the Carthaginians, so I think it's only right if we have a recap. Now remember, this is a Roman story, so I will be using the Roman names for the gods. So who was Aeneas again? Oh right, he was a prince of Troy who just survived the Trojan War by the very skin of his teeth. We found out, if a little later than I'd expected, that he lost his wife in the war, or rather, the escape from the burning city of Troy. But he saved his father and his young son and met up with a number of other surviving Trojans. 
Together, they escaped the city as it burned to sad, depressing rubble. Aeneas was a prince of Troy, but he was also the son of a goddess. Venus, or Aphrodite, is Aeneas' mother and his father, a Trojan named Anchises. The origin story of Aeneas comes from as far back as Homer itself. Aeneas is a major player in the Iliad, and this is where the Romans took his name and basic story from. Aeneas was the son of Venus, and she took it upon herself to help him in the Trojan War as much as she could, though he didn't always need it. Aeneas was second only to Hector when it came to Trojans most skilled in battle. He even went up against Achilles, though that was not one of his finer moments. As one of the Trojans who doesn't die in the Iliad, the Romans found him an appropriate hero to develop their origin story from. He was not only a hero of Troy and of that iconic, famous war, but he was the son of a goddess and so appropriately important and special. When the Romans wanted an origin story they felt was as epic as they believed themselves to be, Aeneas was an obvious choice. And so the story of Aeneas's escape from Troy and his eventual founding of Rome was born. It's a fascinating story, even if you're just considering the propaganda aspects of it. One day I'll dive into that, as personally I would love to know more, but I don't have a wealth of Roman sources at my disposal just right now. In time, though. Aeneas escaped the war, and with a few trials in between that you can revisit by listening to those first few Aeneid episodes that I did before the plague hit, he eventually landed in Carthage. Ugh, Carthage. Listen back to my episode on Dido, the Queen of Carthage, for more on her. I've listed all the relevant episodes in this episode's description if you want to listen back. Aeneas and the other surviving Trojans land on Carthage, and at first, he's separated from those who end up in Dido's court, speaking before the queen. Because remember, Carthage is run by a queen, and only a queen. It's badass, and definitely doesn't end tragically. As every epic travelogue must have, there's also a very angry deity involved. This time, it's Juno, Hera. Juno loves Carthage, and she doesn't love Aeneas or the Trojans. In fact, she's just spent how many years trying to help the Greeks take out Troy? And what, now these Trojans were coming to one of her favorite cities, Carthage? The fucking nerve of them, honestly. Finally, in Carthage, Aeneas reveals himself to Dido and the rest of the Carthaginians and his fellow Trojans, and he tells his story, how he learned that Troy had fallen, how it burned, and how he and the others escaped. He told them all the trouble they encountered en route to Carthage, how they finally got there. Of course, it's filled with dramatic acts of heroism and bravery. Aeneas' story makes he and the Trojans out to be some of the most valiant, overall good people. Again, it's propaganda here. It's interesting how different it is even from the Odyssey. It's very much about how much trouble they faced, even though they were being so good, such good people. He tells the Carthaginians and Dido how, ultimately, all they want is to reach Latium on the Italian mainland because it's been foretold that there he will found a great city that will live on for eternity. Meanwhile, though, Venus has been scheming. She sent her other son, Cupid, down to Earth in disguise so that he could place a spell on Dido. A really, really, really hardcore love spell. Not only will she fall in love with Aeneas, but she will be completely overtaken by her love. Consumed by it. Where we left Aeneas, though, he was still in the midst of telling Dido and the Carthaginians of his trials and his tribulations. Oh, how much drama he encountered on his way from Troy to Carthage. Where we last left him, he had just learned that two Trojans he was sure had died in the war may in fact be still alive. This was a real thrill for Aeneas, but also for us, because Aeneas is about to run into none other than Andromache, the wife of Hector himself, and Helenus, a prince, on the land of Buthrotum.
In Bethrotum, Aeneas and his fellow surviving Trojans hear this rumor that not only are Andromache and Helena still alive, but that Helenus is actually married Andromache after Pyrrhus, Achilles' son, sometimes called Neoptolemus, had left her. And that Helenus had succeeded him in ruling a region of Greece in addition to this marriage to Andromache? Hmm. Of course, still seems shitty for Andromache. I mean, sure, this new husband is at least a Trojan of the same world as her, but she still had absolutely no say in the matter. Truly what a thrill to be an ancient woman. They always keep you on your toes. Aeneas hears this rumor and he's fucking pumped, absolutely bursting with excitement over the idea that there are more Trojans that survived the war. He immediately wants to find her and Helenus and sets out towards the town where he'd heard that they were reigning. But Aeneas didn't have to go far. By chance, he finds Andromache in the woods en route to the town. There, she's paying her respects to her beloved husband Hector, everyone's favorite hero of the Trojan War. She's saying prayers to Hector, telling him how much she misses him, how much she misses their son, Astyanax. And so, When she sees Aeneas coming towards her, this man decked out in all his Trojan armor, this man she recognizes and knows so well, it's as though she were in a dream. It couldn't possibly be real. Poor Andromache immediately assumes he's a ghost, that he too has died like her husband. She asks Aeneas where Hector is. Could she see him too? Ugh. Utter heartbreak, honestly. These two were some of the nicest, least horrible couples of all mythology. Aeneas, himself heartbroken at this, has to explain to Andromache that he's alive. He's really there before her, and so he can't bring her to Hector, nor bring Hector to her. She takes this in stride, though. She's strong as hell. Instead, she tells Aeneas all that's happened since the fall of Troy. She tells him that she was taken away by Pyrrhus, that all the women of Troy who survived were taken similarly, kidnapped and brought far from their homelands, destined to have whatever horrible fates their captors had in store. This side of the story tells you just how horrifying the Greeks were, the things they did to the Trojan women. Andromache tells Aeneas that she was forced to have Pyrrhus' baby in her captivity, but that thankfully, he eventually gave her to Helenus and was distracted instead by Hermione, Helen and Menelaus' daughter, and he ran off with her. But better yet, she continues, Orestes was hounded by furies for the murder of his mother, and it caused him his own fury, which he then took out on Pyrrhus for stealing his wife, Hermione. Orestes killed Pyrrhus on Achilles' own altar fucking badass. Let's all remember that Pyrrhus, or Neoptolemus, like I said, was one of the most horrifying and violent perpetrators of the Trojan War, one of the absolute worst men the Greeks had to offer. He deserved all he got from Orestes. From there, Andromache and Helenus welcome Aeneas and the other Trojans to their town, a town they'd set out to resemble Troy in whatever way they could, They had a small stream, they called it Xanthus, Scamander, for the river in Troy. They had a small gate, they called it the Skane Gate, after Troy's magnificent wall's own gates. Andromache and Helenus had made this town their own, even if it didn't resemble Troy's glory or beauty. Aeneas and the other Trojans felt at home there. They stay for a while, comfortable and happy for a time. But it can't last forever, and eventually the wind calls the sails of their ships, and they decide they need to continue on. But Aeneas is given warning before they do, of how best to get to Italy and what to avoid. Avoid going too close to the land, he's told, for there are enemies all around, Greeks who would kill Trojans in a second. Beware of Circe's island and of Scylla and Charybdis, all the beasts and monsters that Odysseus encountered on his own trip from Troy to Greece. The same are a threat to Aeneas, and he must watch out. Scylla and Charybdis, of course, lie on either side of Sicily's Strait of Messina, where it reaches out towards mainland Italy. They are the real threat, as Aeneas and his men are attempting to reach Latium on the west side of Italy's peninsula. Finally, Aeneas is told about the Sibyl in the cave, a woman who can see the future and locks it away. Helenus heaps gifts upon Aeneas, his father Anchises, and the other Trojans, 
everything they can spare, so much gold that once belonged to Pyrrhus, but fuck that guy. So it's given to Aeneas in preparation for their journey and what they might encounter. But it's also an investment. An investment in Aeneas's cause, founding a new and mighty city with the very same blood of fallen Troy. <laughs> Aeneas and the Trojans set sail, and before long, they spot land. Land they know to be Sicily, but with Sicily comes Scylla and Charybdis. Having been warned about exactly that, the Trojans manage to avoid the swirling depths of Charybdis' whirlpool and the monstrous many heads of Scylla, but once they're free of those dangerous waters, they're utterly exhausted. The ships float lazily, none of the men having the energy to continue rowing on which leads them to drift near the island of the Cyclops. Don't trouble yourselves trying to work out the geography of the Aeneid versus the Odyssey, or the Odyssey in general. Crazier scholars than you have tried and failed. Regardless, they round the coast of Sicily, where even Mount Etna is feeling a little more stressed and anxious than one would hope. The volcano that is Mount Etna is spewing ash and smoke, even stones rain down from angry, angry Mount Etna the giant and Calados bellowing in anger beneath it. But as unappealing as Sicily sounds at the moment, Aeneas and his men land on the island for some reason. Quite quickly, they come upon a man who hasn't seen other humans in quite, quite some time. His hair is long and ragged, he's thin and leathery from the sun. He, well, he doesn't look good. He calls upon the Trojans immediately and knows who they are. He tells them that, yes, he fought against them in Troy, that he killed their people, and he's very sorry for it. He asks the Trojans to either forgive him then and there and take him with them, for he's been alone for so, so long, or just kill him. Death at their hands would be better than death alone on the island. The man is Achaemenides. He tells the Trojans that he sailed on Ulysses' own ship, Odysseus, as I prefer to call him, but we must remain true to Rome here. He was on Ulysses' ship as they attempted their journey home to Ithaca from Troy, but tragedy struck. Achaemenides very much blames Ulysses for his misfortune, but you all know I'm a sucker for the man and straight up biased in my love for him. According to Achaemenides, he was stranded on Sicily, what they call the Cyclops Island, when he was abandoned by Ulysses and his men. Just as Achaemenides has finished telling Aeneas and the Trojans his story of woe about what a horrible thing Ulysses, that pesky Greek, did to him, about how horrifying it was to encounter Polyphemus, they're startled by, yes, you guessed it, Polyphemus. The giant one-eyed man pushes apart a clump of trees to reveal himself to the Trojans, who look on in horror, knowing exactly who they've just been found by, having just heard the story of Polyphemus' time with Ulysses. They run for it, and thankfully Polyphemus is weighed down by his own size and the blindness Ulysses inflicted upon him. The Trojans make it to their ship, looking on at Polyphemus as he rages upon the shore. He calls on the other Cyclops who join him, the whole group of them looking on in anger at Aeneas and the Trojans, as they sail away, Achaemenides with them. But where to go next? They'd been warned about Scylla and Charybdis and had only just escaped the whirlpool earlier. They certainly couldn't go near that pass again. The island was a no-no, as it was pretty full of angry, one-eyed giants, not to mention a spewing volcano. They were left with one option. Another place Hellenist told them of, but hadn't mentioned anything bad that might happen there. Seems like the perfect spot. Or Tigia, it's called. So they land there. But there! And we're not told how, or when, or why, or really anything except... And Kizzy's dies. Aeneas's father, the man he'd risked so much to save from Troy, his best friend and confidant, dies. Seriously, the things this book dwells on versus the things it just lets go as if they were minor details. It's a trip. Anyway, Achilles is dead from God only knows what. I think maybe he was tired? Old age? I don't know, but thankfully... We spent a good long time on Ulysses leaving this random dude on an island. And with that last 
tidbit of tragedy. Aeneas finishes his story, leaving the palace of Carthage, where everyone has been feasting, in a slightly awkward, definitely tragic, silence. That night, the love spell that Venus and Cupid placed on Dido takes effect, or takes even more effect, that is. Her love for Aeneas grows stronger and stronger. It begins to take over her thoughts entirely. She thinks about how brave he's been in his travels from Troy, how wonderful he and his people are. She thinks about his son, who was Cupid in disguise as he sat in her lap, just a taste of the love she would develop, all because of Aeneas's goddess mother and her famous love god son. The way Dido's love for Aeneas is described is continuous foreshadowing of what's to come for this woman. A woman who founded a city all on her own to escape tyrannical men, who led the city well, who grew it into a beautiful and powerful force in the Mediterranean. A woman who would have done just fine if Aeneas and his Trojans had never landed there in the first place, destined to fuck shit up for her and her people. But I'm getting ahead of myself, because it's fucking badass that Dido was the queen of Carthage, and it's really fucked up how things go down all because Carthage was a major enemy of Rome. It's all part of the propaganda. But again, we'll get there. For now, quote, The queen's lifeblood fed her grievous love wound. An unseen flame gnawed at her hour on hour. When Dido wakes, she finds herself in full, obsessive throes of love for Aeneas. She calls to her sister, Anna, and tells her about her feelings, what she thinks of him, how she's thought of him since she first saw him and can't seem to think of anything else. She tells Anna that she's had terrifying dreams all out of her love for Aeneas, that she believes him to be the child of a god. Dido tells Anna that she is even considering whether she could marry him. She'd sworn off marriage after her first husband died, but Aeneas is making her rethink it. Oh, Aeneas. The sisters continue to talk about Aeneas, about Dido's fears, about her guilt for even considering marrying another man when her own husband, Sicaeus, had died so tragically at the hands of her own brother. The entirety of where her life is now, her founding of Carthage to begin with, her leaving her own country of Phoenicia, it's all based in the original tragedy of her husband. Could she really consider marrying again? Maybe for Aeneas. Gee, I wonder how this is going to go. Oh, nerds, thank you all for listening. I'm both excited to be back in the Aeneid and frustrated at how hard it can be to transform the Aeneid into a piece of fun and exciting storytelling. Anyway, Aeneas is cool, and who doesn't love Dido? But man, the Romans sure were high on themselves. I hope you're all staying safe. I had to let go of the Aeneid due to my own lockdown earlier in the year and an inability to focus on the story and for the aforementioned reasons. And I've picked it back up because I personally have been out of lockdown for quite some time. That said, I know everyone's all over the world and in all very different positions when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a very odd and interesting time to live in, especially when you have an international group of awesome people listening in to the mythology every week. I've been lucky, up to now at least, living where I do, but we're already beginning our second wave and likely to experience some kind of lockdown again, so who knows what will happen, but for now, we're back with Aeneas, like I said, for a few weeks at a time before diving into other stories for a breather in between intense bouts of, thankfully very much entertaining, Roman propaganda. Oh, Augustus, how you loved yourself. If you haven't already, please pre-order my book, because I have a book that's available for pre-order. It's insanity. I'm truly never getting over it. Thank you all. Uh, as usual, rate, review, subscribe. Please follow me on social media. I'm Myths Baby everywhere. You're all wonderful. Stay safe. Be smart. And don't fuck with this pandemic. You'll end up hurting yourself or others. Wash your damn hands. Black Lives Matter. Trans rights are human rights. I am Liv and I love this shit. <laughs>